All right. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Homeownership Capacity 1921 Application Materials Review Webinar. Um, so my name is Ruth Dubose. I am the Program Manager for the Homeownership Capacity Program. I'm joined today by Q Vang. Uh, she um, is on the Homeownership Capacity team. She's also the HECAT Program Manager. Uh, she will be monitoring uh, the question box today. Um, so if you do have any questions as we go through the materials, please feel free to enter those in the question box. We are anticipating uh, having quite a few people on the call, so we will keep the lines uh, muted for, for, the, um, for the entire uh, presentation. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that we will probably need the entire hour and a half for the call. Uh, this call will be recorded and posted to our website for future playback. Just before we get started, if, uh, if you could raise your hand just to make sure um, that you can uh, hear me, that would be great. All right, we're looking good. All right, let's jump in here. So for today, uh, we'll be talking briefly about um, some resources for you or that are available to you as you complete your application. We'll be um, talking just briefly as well about the um, HECAT program and how, um, how homeownership capacity uh, um, can be connected to, to the same clients that are being served under HECAT. And then we'll really be spending the, the majority of our time on the application itself. Um, looking at uh, the funding and awards, we'll be reviewing the application materials, um, talking briefly about our financial review process, um, we'll run through the re uh, submission process, um, and then we'll uh, end our time with talking about how we score the application and what are the next steps that you can expect. All right. So. Um, <clears throat> We do have the um, Homeownership Capacity Program Training. There's a webinar in PowerPoint um, that will be posted to our website here within the next couple of days. Um, we recently had the program manual approved by our board. Um, if you're a current grantee, really what that manual does is it takes a lot of the information uh, from the grant contract, or excuse me, from the Exhibit A uh, to the grant contract, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as other parts of um, other exhibits, and we've really um, consolidated it into a much more user-friendly format. Um, so if you're an existing grantee, there isn't anything new in that. Um, if you're a new applicant, um, uh, we do highly uh, recommend you go and listen to, um, to that webinar. Um, it covers the phases of the homeownership capacity program, talks about the client file requirements, and other programmatic requirements. Uh, in addition to that, we do require uh, use of our homeownership capacity data collection system for reporting on all clients that are served under the program. Uh, we won't be covering that <clears throat> in much detail today except just to notate or to highlight that it is a requirement um, for use uh, if you're participating in the homeownership capacity program. We do have a webinar in PowerPoint uh, posted on our website um, that goes through um, just how the system works. Um, so a um, couple things to notate. Um, for now, it is a web-based data entry system. Uh, there's no charge to use it. And then the training um, covers uh, client data entry um, as they progress through the program. Uh, if, um, if someone is interested, we're more than happy to provide a copy of the grant contract. So that is something else. Uh, that's a resource. We do have the uh, funding awards for the 18-19 year posted on our website if you're interested to look at uh, the awards in the past um, past grantees or excuse me the grantees for this year. And then we also have the application instructions which covers the minimum requirements, um, the priorities, the application due date and submission process, and the scoring and remaining timeline uh, for the application process.
So uh, last year, in the 17-18 year, uh, the Homeownership Center updated their standards guide to include long-term financial wellness services. Um, so HECAT applicants may now apply for any or all of the following program areas. Um, we have um, all five of them listed um, with uh, financial wellness um, as the, the newest addition here back in the 17-18 year. The reason that we bring that up for, uh, for today's presentation um, is because um, some of the clients that are served um, in the financial wellness um, uh, service under HECAT um, may also be counted um, under homeownership capacity. Um, so that's one of the benefits. Um, and another benefit is that agencies can now apply for funding from two different sources uh, for the financial capability uh, wellness services. Um, in terms of the applications, there will still be two separate applications as usual. And then um, for funding decisions, if um, selected to receive funding under both programs, um, awards will be taken into consideration, um, awards will take into consideration funding um, from both of those uh, sources. So you may have noticed on the first slide, and we also have it referenced here, uh, the program year is now 2019 through 2021. Um, so that is a two-year uh, two um, grant rather than, um, rather than just a one-year, which is what we've been operating under uh, since the homeownership capacity program launched in 2014. So these are some really important details to keep in mind as you're um, completing your application. So right now we have uh, funds available in the amount of $750,000 to $1 million uh, for the first half of this two-year grant cycle. Um, any applicants applying now are applying for funding for the full two years. Um, however, we will only be able to make uh, the allocation awards um, covering that first half of, um, of this two-year grant cycle. So for grantees uh, funded for the first half of the 2019-2021 year, uh, you will not need to reapply for the second half of, of this um, grant cycle. Funding for the second year will be contingent upon availability of funds, grantee performance, and other requirements. So we will be issuing an amendment um, and executing that prior to uh, the start of that second, um, second year of the grant cycle. This will include any additional funds, uh, goals, and any additional contract requirements to cover that second year of the grant. Um, award announcements for that second uh, year in the cycle will be made prior to the execution of the amendment. Um, the biggest benefit for you in moving to this um, two-year uh, contract is that there's no annual application. So fast forward a year from now, uh, you won't have to go through another application process similar to what you're having to go through right now and have had to go through in, uh, in all the previous years. So we're defining uh, new applicants in this slide as someone that didn't apply now um, in 2019 for the full two years, but wishes to apply for the second half of the grant cycle. Um, so what we will be doing for, for uh, interested parties is that the application will reopen for the second half of that 19 to 21 program year only if there's interest. Um, if an organization is interested in applying, they must send an email uh, to the email reference on the screen no later than Monday, February 24th, 2020. Um, if we do receive any emails at that time, we'll be reopening the application um, and allowing, like I said, new applicants in for the second part of this uh, two-year cycle. Um, if it's a new applicant and they are awarded funds, the recipient will uh, have a contract that covers just the last year of that two-year grant, um, and announcements, award announcements will be made uh, prior to October 1st, 2020, if applicable. And the award announcements would be made at the same time that it would be for any um, for any existing grantees that are going to be um, receiving awards for that second year. So 
So we won't go into, uh, into the details uh, much beyond this slide, but do want to highlight um, some terminology that we use in the application. So we reference prior to purchase. Um, those would be clients that are working on behavioral changes to remove barriers to home ownership, and they're going to be working uh, with your organization anywhere from six months to three years. Um, and then we reference post-purchase, and that's going to be follow-up with clients that have com uh, that completed prior to purchase services. And that's going to be up to one year after the client has completed work under that prior to purchase phase. Um, so again, just want to remind you of the um, Homeownership Capacity Program training that's posted on our website. Um, that's going to provide a lot more information around um, both of these phases, as well as um, um, other uh, reporting requirements um, uh, as it relates to the program. So definitely go back and listen to that webinar um, if you haven't done so already um, and are not as familiar with the program and with these um, with these phases. All right, so all of our um, application materials can be found on our website. Um, we have broken down the website into two sections. So we have um, a section for preparing your application where you'll find the instructions, um, a PDF of the questions, and then tips for completing your online application. And then we have a separate section for um, actually applying. And that's where we have the link for the online application form, the workbook, and then the signature page. So we're gonna hop over to our website and pull up um, the material. So this is the main page of our website. So um, if you're not going through the hyperlink um, that's included in the slide, you'll go to the community development section on our website. And then you will go to the homeownership education and counseling. So all of the homeownership capacity materials have moved under this section. Um, until recently, they were over in the other community development programs section of our website. So you'll click there. And here you'll see um, the two sections that we previously talked about. All right. All right, so um, this format looks very different from the application uh, narratives that were completed last year. Um, a big change uh, this year is that we are using an online application form um, to collect the narrative responses and to also collect um, the additional materials uh, that you're submitting um, with um, with your application questions. So that's going to be the workbook, the signature page, um, and then some um, additional documents that we'll get into a little bit later. So um, applicants are provided with a PDF of um, all of the questions. Um, however, you're not going to be completing your responses uh, in this, um, in, within this document. You'll actually be, um, this is really just for you to use to prepare your answers and then you'll be transferring those over to the online application form, which we'll um, go through in a little bit. Um, so you'll notice this is broken up into boxes. Um, each of these boxes represents a, a separate page within uh, the um, online application form. Um, so it really should follow um, almost exactly to what you're seeing uh, in the online application form and ultimately making transferring over your responses into that um, should be very easy to do that. So of course, um, applicants will be asked to enter the first and last name of the person completing the form and their email address, their organization name and phone number. Um, we'll talk about this in a few slides, but do want to encourage you to think about one person within your organization that will actually be entering all the information into the online application form. Um, if you're going to have other people working on different parts of the application, um, we certainly recommend you do that outside of the online application form, um, recommending that you work 
um, within Word or some, something like that um, to complete your responses. And then, like I said, having that one identified person actually transferring that data over into the application form. Uh, we do have uh, the links for the materials that you all also find on our website. And then we do have some instructions throughout, uh, throughout this document um, asking applicants to um, complete certain tabs of the workbook um, as they're going through the application um, or as they're going through the online application form. The reason for that is because um, some of the materials in the workbook um, um, go along with some of the, the questions that you're completing. So, um, so you'll see question, or, um, directions throughout uh, this document about which tabs to complete um, as you move through um, as you move through the, the application questions. So here the first instruction is completing the general info and funding request tab as well as the service availability tab of the workbook. Um, when you're completing your workbook, just one thing to note is that you do want to click enable editing. Uh, you will be able to uh, or you should be able to enter your information. I think people have been able to do that in the past. I'm not able to do that now. But um, if you're able to do that, but you haven't clicked Enable Editing, you won't be able to save what you've entered. So make sure that you start by clicking Enable Editing, and then you should be able to, to save uh, the workbook from there. So here you'll enter your organization's um, name, and then you'll select uh, the region. So either greater, min, metro, or statewide. Um, you'll enter your organization type, and then you'll enter the federal tax ID, state tax ID, and then the year your organization was established. Uh, in the next uh, chart here, you're going to be listing uh, the contacts for your organization, um, and then all their, all their information. Uh, this is really important uh, to identify who should receive a copy of the grant agreement. Um, and we can certainly send that to more than one person. It is sent by email. Um, so I know sometimes um, organizations in the past have identified the executive director um, and, and only the executive director. And then sometimes that gets lost on someone's desk or in their email. Um, so um, certainly feel free to add more than one person. Uh, to this list, um, and they will all be included on the email um, with the grant contract once some, um, uh, if, if awarded funds. And then down in this section, uh, this is where you'll be requesting uh, the dollar amount and then the households that will be served uh, with the award. Again, we have broken it out by um, two years. If you are applying at this point, uh, the assumption is that you will likely be applying for both years. However, if one of these um, columns is blank, um, our assumption will be that you're not applying for funds for, for that year. So make sure that you are separating out your dollar award request and the household that would be served between these two, um, two columns. And then here you're just uh, anticipating how long the average client will remain in your program. And then down here, you're going to be uh, telling us how many years your organization has been providing uh, financial empowerment, education, and coaching services. Um, and you're going to indicate the, the years and the months for that. And again, the important distinction here is that financial empowerment, education, and coaching um, is different than uh, home buyer counseling, which is going to be that shorter term service. On the next tab, uh, you will be including um, the geography that will be served. We are asking applicants to, um, just for simplicity's sake, identify um, seven county metro, 11 county metro, statewide, uh, and or listing um, counties individually. So maybe you're an applicant that is serving the seven county metro plus maybe two greater men counties. So you would list seven county metro and then the other two uh, counties that would be served. Um, we have, if you completed applications with us in the past, um, we had an option on the chart here for um, uh, identifying if clients would be served by phone, in person, or both. Um, really, we're just making the assumption that if clients wish to travel, um, that you would serve them 
um, either if they wish to travel or would be served by phone, um, that you'd be serving clients from any of the counties um, listed. So we're really not, we're, we've removed that distinction. And then on the bottom part, we are asking for office locations. Um, this would be all office locations that our um, services are being provided out of, um, whether you're meeting with clients at that location or not in person. Um, so make sure to list all of um, all the offices. And then if you are offering any in-home visits, um, make sure to put that in the chart as well. Um, and for that, you would just put in home here under the address section, and then you would leave um, the city, zip, and county uh, blank. So moving back uh, to the questions, the next question within the online application form is, is your organization a returning grantee? We're defining that as receiving grant funding in one or more program years. And then depending on the response, uh, you'll complete either the returning grantee questions um, or the new applicant question. So for returning grantee, um, if yes, um, was uh, what was the household serve goal in the most recent grant contract with Minnesota Housing? For most applicants, that's going to be identified in Exhibit A.1 of your um, homeownership capacity 2018-2019 uh, or excuse me, 2018-2019 grant contract. So you're going to list that number here, and then you're going to refer to the total uh, here for household served um, in uh, in column um, H20. And if that ends up, um, uh, let's see, if the total there ends up being more than double um, what you had um, for your one-year contract, um, we're going to ask you to provide some additional information explaining how you will reach the number of households um, proposed. So in this example, um, say you had entered 10,000 for each year to serve um, 20 clients. So now if you're proposing, or excuse me, if, you're, if your goal in your grant contract was say eight, um, you know, eight times two is going to be 16, but now you're proposing 20. And so you are going to want to respond to uh, this question, telling us how you're going to be reaching uh, those additional households. I will say that we do look closely at past production. So this is a really important question um, to put some time into um, if you're, when you're thinking about making a case for how you're going to be able to serve more than what you've been able to previously demonstrate. Um, so while we're asking for your contracted amount here, um, like I said, we're also thinking and factoring in um, previous production. If you're a new applicant, we are asking that you provide uh, two professional references. Um, and we've included a, a, a chart within um, the online application form uh, for you to include that. Um, really be thinking about who the reference could be that could speak specifically to the intensive financial education and coaching services, A, and B, make sure that this person um, knows that we will be contacting them. We do contact uh, anyone that's listed. Um, I will say in the past when we've made contacts, um, Sometimes the reference can't really speak to the services provided uh, or the services that we're, that we're calling about. Um, and others have actually said that they don't feel comfortable uh, answering um, our questions because they might have um, a relationship with your organization as maybe a funder. And so they don't um, feel comfortable answering those questions. So really think about those that you're listing and make sure that they're going to be, um, be the best fit for what we're looking for. All right, so moving on, um, we have a, a few questions here, um, just learning a little bit more about uh, your general program information. Um, 
So again, we're really trying to make the distinction in this question between a traditional home buyer uh, counseling and education um, and the services under home ownership capacity, which have that focus on financial education and coaching um, to help clients focus on their behaviors to achieve self-defined financial goals. So the first question is, how are the education and coaching services provided by your organization different from traditional home buyer education and counseling? Um, and then giving us a little bit more information about your experience providing these services. And then a question about how do you ensure your staff are culturally competent? Uh, the next uh, section is around complementary services. So here you're telling us a little bit more about other services that clients would benefit from by working with your organization. Um, so this might be down payment assistance that you offer, individual development accounts, um, employment services, lending circles, credit builder loans, things like that. And then we do allow organizations uh, to partner um, with other organizations to provide these services. Um, so this section here really um, asks for more information around um, that relationship. A couple of things to keep in mind. Um, the only organiz There can only be one organization named on the contract with Minnesota Housing. So whoever that organization um, is, is going to be responsible for all the oversight uh, and management of those direct service partnerships. And then throughout the rest of the application, uh, if you are um, proposing to partner with an organization, you're going to want to make sure that you're um, factoring in what their roles and responsibilities will be um, and including that in your responses. Um, and, if there's, um, and if it's clearly defined that one, one partner organization will be responsible for um, you know, items one through three and you're responsible for four through six, making sure that you're actually um, identifying who's going to be responsible for what. Give us a really good picture. Um, the reviewers are not all, um, they don't all work closely with the program as Q and I do. So, um, so you want to make sure that you're really, um, really uh, describing that relationship. Um, so here you'll be asked, are you proposing to, pro um, to provide services with a partner organization or organizations? Yes or no. If so, we'll ask the names of those organizations or the, the organizations and then the role of each partner. Um, and then the funds that are requested in the workbook here, um, we're asking for further information about a breakdown of um, how those funds will be distributed um, and then how you arrived at, um, how, how you determine who's going to be receiving what and then what your oversight is going to look like of those partner organizations to ensure compliance with the grant requirements. So any partner organization um, will have to follow the same requirements under the program uh, that you have to follow as the grantee. Uh, this entire section, the administrator section, is uh, not scored. Um, however, this really does paint a good picture for the reviewer. So um, make sure to, um, to take your time in, in completing these uh, answers. And I will say I, um, that none of these questions have changed. So if you're a previous applicant, um, these questions have not changed from previous years. And it looks like we do have a question. So I'm going to pause and uh, look at that here for just a minute. So the question is, would we be considered a returning grantee if we currently received HECAT funds but haven't received home ownership capacity funds for several years? Um, certainly you would be considered uh, a returning grantee, although I would, um, if you could reach out to me here after the webinar so we can talk through that a little bit further um, and make sure that, um, that we're directing you um, uh, appropriately in our in our response. All right, so switching gears back now to the application. Um, let's see here. The uh, experience and outcomes section is the next section of the application. 
The application as a whole is worth 100 points. Um, this section is worth 25. So um, the, the two tabs of the workbook that need to be completed are the past production and experience and the outcomes tab. If you're a new applicant, um, you're going to be completing those on your own. If you're a returning grantee, um, we have taken information that we have in SciSense and um, uh, put that into both of these tabs for you. Um, so what we are asking that if, that you um, take a look at those, uh, make sure that that is consistent with your numbers. Um, you know, of course, SciSense only reflects clients that are in the homeownership capacity program. So if you have any clients that aren't rep represented um, in, under the homeownership capacity program, um, but they are part of your uh, financial empowerment um, programming, we want to make sure that um, that those get uh, that those numbers also get included in there. Let's first take a look at those two tabs. All right. So um, the, if you completed this tab or this in the past with us, um, last year we only had one year's worth of data represented. Here we are actually asking for about four and a half years worth of, of data. Um, we learned through the application process last year that we were not really getting a complete picture of, um, of the, um, the clients that were being served and the outcomes um, by only focusing in on one year, especially because this is a longer term service. So we have extended that time frame. Um, so keep that in mind. These dates are really important as you're pulling your data. Um, so we're looking at clients, or excuse me, households that have been served between August 1st, 2014 and December 31st, 2018, with the goal of home ownership. Um, so again, this is a really important distinction, especially for um, organizations that serve clients with a variety of goals. You know, maybe they're coming in because they're interested, they have a primary goal in starting their own business or going back to school. Um, you really want to um, not include those numbers. We're really looking at just the clients that you're working with that have that goal of home ownership. So you're going to enter that total here. And then what you'll notice is that when I enter this number here, uh, the total um, in the, the two charts below turned red. The reason for that is because uh, the number now does not match with what's listed up here. Um, so that's going to be a good checks and balance for you, um, that if you see any red cells, that there is something that is not matching, and you should look more closely at that. Um, so your race and ethnicity chart, you're going to be um, listing um, the uh, distribution of households that have been served, so those 50 households, um, what, uh, what was the distribution of um, but amongst the, the race and ethnicity um, categories listed here. And then you'll notice um, that the, the chart is um, anywhere that's gray, I should add, in these charts. Um, it's a locked field that's actually doing the calculations for you. So this is just showing the distribution um, among uh, these different, um, uh, different race identifications. And then uh, down here in the chart, you'll be um, entering um, the uh, breakdown of um, income. So we, um, we have the different income brackets here, and then we've broken it down by 11 County Metro, Rochester, MSA, and then the balance of the state. So you'll want to complete this chart. And then you'll notice that the red turned to gray um, when, uh, when those numbers matched up. Uh, the next tab is looking at outcomes. So again, we're following the same time frame, August 1st, 2014 through December 31st, 2018. You're indicating the number of households that reported an outcome. It's really important, again, to make sure that you're pulling out clients that went through um, your home buyer education and counseling services that is uh, viewed as a different service type, and those uh, the outcomes under um, those two service types should not be included in this chart. We're looking at really just 
those clients that came in with the goal of home ownership and that went through your intensive financial empowerment, education, and coaching services, um, how many reported an outcome, and then what was the distribution among these three categories? So how many reported a home purchase? Uh, how many reported uh, not pursuing home ownership? And then how many continued to Going back to the application, uh, you will be asked a question, um, is, uh, is the home purchase percentage in cell uh, C13 of the outcomes tab of the workbook below 35%? So here we're looking at uh, this tab. And um, if this is below 35%, uh, then you will um, will be asking for a little bit of um, context on that. So providing further explanation um, around that. Um, it just helps to paint a better picture for the reviewer. Um, you know, certainly there's, um, we're seeing that more and more where you might have low home purchase percentages, um, but you might have a high percentage of clients that are continuing to pursue home ownership after one year. Uh, maybe um, they're trying to build more in their savings. Um, maybe they are unable to find um, a home that's affordable. Um, uh, maybe they've made attempts to purchase a home and um, haven't haven't been able to um, to successfully um, get get to that point. So give us a little bit more information about um, why that percentage might be below that 35%. Um, could also be that your program is newer, resulting in um, fewer results to demonstrate uh, that at this time. All right, so moving on to the proposed client demographics and outreach. Um, so here you're really uh, sharing with us um, more about um, the clients that you're proposing to serve um, in the next two years. So you'll see uh, this tab, it looks very similar, um, almost exactly the same to that past production and experience. Um, so here you'll be giving us um, some estimates around uh, the breakdown for race and ethnicity, and then um, some um, estimates for uh, the, um, the income breakdown. This uh, tab, the past production and experience tab, can be really helpful in making those projections, especially if you're not planning to do any sort of um, targeting um, to, to new populations, that can be really helpful in um, giving you a sense of what that breakdown might be. And we don't hold grantees uh, to, to this number exactly. Um, you know, so if you're, you know, if you're off by, by a few in terms of the clients that you've served, um, but if there is a, a pretty drastic swing um, from what you have proposed, that is something that we would um, want to learn a little bit more about. As you'll see, um, these cells are both red, and that's because the number here does not match um, the total listed here. And this is because Q's amazing and has done some really great work with our, um, with our workbook. So um, here you're proposing to serve um, 20, 20 households. Um, you'll see that that um, turned to gray once you um, once you once your total hits 20. And keep in mind again, you're you're giving up projections for uh, two years, not for just um, not for just one year. So taking a look then at um, this column of the workbook, um, you've got, um, if you enter a projection to serve households that have an income um, less than or equal to 20,000 in any parts of the state, we are asking for a little bit more information on that. So here it's a yes, no question. Um, does your proposal include serving those households? If yes, um, tell us a little bit more about how these households will be able to achieve um, home ownership. Um, just as a reminder, uh, the homeownership capacity program is for clients that have that goal of homeownership and will be able to address their barriers to homeownership within three years of entering the program. 
Um, one common um, um, thing that we hear from grantees is that um, you know clients have this lower income to start with, um, but they're maybe in school, and so by the time they graduate, uh, there is the expectation that they'll have more income. Um, other clients are maybe receiving job coaching either through your organization or through another organization, um, and the expectation is through that um, they'll also have um, have more income. So just kind of be thinking about um, about you know how set clients are with that income. Um, if it's likely to change, tell us a little bit more about that. If it's not going to change, um, tell us um, again just um, how these clients will be able to achieve home ownership. And this is not a new question from last year. We did ask this question last year as well. And same with the next question, uh, which is really specific to outreach, where you're telling us your strategies uh, for identifying and marketing uh, to the homeowner, or identifying and marketing your services. Um, so really sharing with us your specific plan, um, and then listing any partnerships um, that you have established with other organizations to help identify and reach out to potential households. The next uh, section, uh, staff experience and certification, this is two points. Uh, you will see in the workbook um, that the chart has changed quite a bit. Um, so um, asking for some information about um, the, the staff that will be working um, uh, directly with clients. Um, and then we're asking for you to list just their certifications that they've received. And that's going to be anything that connects back to um, the homeownership capacity services. So you're going to be listing uh, any and all certifications, who the certifying entity is, and then the original certification date. Um, and if the um, certification is still uh, valid, then you're going to be listing the expiration date. As a reminder, we do require that um, uh, organizations have at least one person that has a current certification, uh, current financial capability certification. Um, if your organization does not have that, strongly encourage you to, um, uh, to have them attend one of the upcoming NeighborWorks Training Institutes. I believe there's one in August. Um, if you're sending someone to that, then you would uh, list August as their anticipated certification date. Um, if there aren't plans for that, then you're going to list whatever whatever the anticipated certification date would be. So this next section, um, it's really your program design for offering these services. This section probably saw um, kind of the biggest, um, not really the biggest changes, but really um, kind of how the questions were ordered, um, how they were um, kind of coupled with other questions. Um, so really make sure that, especially if you're looking back at past applications, that you are um, reading the questions carefully and making sure that you're answering the question um, in its entirety. Um, what we've done here is we, we realized that with how the, how the questions were worded last year, um, we were Kind of missing a little bit of information about some of the phases of the program that a client's going to go through. So um, we really broke this out by kind of from start to finish um, your work with a client under the program. Um, so the first uh, question here is introduction of service offerings. So you're describing uh, how clients are introduced to services offered by your organization. Um, so you know our clients uh, introduced one at a time through an intake process? Do they start with a general overview class um, that's required for all potential uh, clients and then they're moved into an intake process from there? So you're really kind of um, uh, sharing with us how clients are going to start working with your organization. Uh, next, we're asking you to describe your intake process. Um, and we are asking you to include information about income and credit thresholds how your organization determines that a client will be able to purchase within three years, and how level of client commitment is determined. Um, last year, this was um, three separate questions in the application. We've just included it as one question this year. Um, but like I said, make sure that you are covering um, 
all three of those bullets, um, as well as just in general describing your intake process um, as you answer this question. So here we're taking a look at prior to purchase. Um, so describing how clients uh, receive program services after intake. Um, so some examples um, that we've seen, you know, clients may take a class and then they might work one-on-one -on -one with a coach after that. Um, other organizations uh, provide services um, just just one-on-one, -on -one, so they're providing both the education and the coaching one-on-one -on -one for all clients. There's maybe no classroom um, education involved. Um, we allow organizations to develop um, their program design uh, as, um, as best uh, suited for, for the um, populations that they're serving. Um, but here you're really going to be telling us more about that. Um, so make sure your response tells us more about what's required and optional for participation. Um, really important note to emphasize is that one-on-one -on -one is required for all clients under the Homeownership Capacity Program. So if you do not indicate that in your response, it's going to have a pretty significant negative impact on your score. Um, so really make sure to, to highlight that in your response. Tell us more about the average uh, number of hours um, that clients might be working with your program, and especially if you have um, you know, a, an or a classroom education component and one-on-one. -on -one. Um, tell us about how clients um, will be, or how much time they'll spend in both, and then any curriculums that you're that you're using. Um, again, please do not include home stretch or other home buyer education services. Um, that is viewed as a separate service um, that you are referring clients to, even if your organization serves or provides that service. Um, it should not be included as a, as a curriculum that is um, provided to clients under the um, homeownership capacity program. And then why, why your service delivery uh, method is the best for the population that you're serving. So again, this, a lot of these questions were in the workbook chart last year. Um, we really wanted to, um, we felt like that really limited uh, the responses that we were receiving and didn't give us kind of that full context. So that's why we've moved it into a narrative um, set of questions. And then the next two questions, you're giving us the roles and responsibilities of both the coach and the client in that prior to purchase phase. There's a question here about, do staff need the financial capability certification if they have passed their HUD certification? And the answer is yes. We do still require uh, that financial capability certification through NeighborWorks, um, even if an organization um, has staff that have passed their HUD certification. All right, so um, this next uh, set of questions um, was taken from a chart in the workbook. Um, so here we have a list of um, topics that would be covered um, under um, homeownership capacity, um, and then um, a list of subtopics. So um, last year, the topics were listed, and then applicants um, could enter their own um, subtopics. Here we've given um, some subtopics uh, that we um, would like to see organizations cover uh, with their clients. Um, we have given for each of these um, space to fill in the blank for anything that's not listed here. Um, if you don't cover any, this, any of the topics listed, or um, then you're going to list uh, or click NA um, in the chart um, under, under that topic. So we've got all of the, the subtopics listed. And then you'll have some, some space um, to enter anything else that wasn't, um, didn't kind of have a place in, in the um, questions previously asked. This next section um, around the previous, or excuse me, program completion and outcomes. Um, this is really where you're going to see um, some new, new questions. Um, so the first question is, how is it determined that a client uh, is finished receiving the financial empowerment, education, and coaching services? And then um, 
you're going to be telling us a little bit more about a coach's typical engagement with clients that decide to pursue home ownership. Um, so in that, you're going to be telling us more about um, coaching that is available to clients through the home buying process when a client receives or is referred to home buyer education and counseling, how outcomes are collected for clients that purchase or continue to pursue home ownership. Um, and then recognizing that clients that decide to not pursue home ownership may need um, different, different services or different level of services. Um, so we've separated that, separated that into a separate question where you're telling us uh, more about the coaching that's provided to those clients and then how you're collecting outcomes for those clients. The next set of questions then looks at the post-purchase services. Um, so similar to the prior to purchase services, uh, here you're gonna be telling us about um, clients that have completed uh, their financial empowerment education and coaching and what that service looks like. So what are you making available to them? Um, what's required and what's optional for participation? Um, average number of hours, any curriculums that you're using? And then describing again why um, this is the best way to, to deliver the services to the population served by your organization. And then um, you're telling us again about the roles and responsibilities of the coach and client in that uh, post purchase phase. And then next we've got um, some topics uh, that we encourage organizations to offer. Um, you will have uh, an option um, in the in the next question to describe those services in more detail. If you click on any of these in the online application form, uh, you are certifying that um, you are providing or making those services available um, to all clients that have participated in your program. The next uh, question here, we're really looking at um, how your organization um, keeps clients engaged, especially those that um, lose touch with their coach at any point in the process. So you're describing that a little bit more in this question. And then finally, we have a set of capacity questions. Um, so if your organization is not already providing financial education and coaching, um, or if additional capacity is needed beyond current staffing, um, tell us a little bit more about what that implementation plan looks like. Um, and then if no, um, if your organization is already providing the service um, or no additional capacity is needed, you just would indicate that in the space below. This is a new question here. Um, we're asking how many financial wellness clients are currently in your organization's pipeline? So really be thinking about cases that are still active um, both those that have not reached program completion and those that, um, that have um, reached program completion and you're still working to collect an outcome. Um, so you're going to list that number here um, because we're really looking at, we really want to get a full picture of not only what your past production has been, what are you proposing to do, and what, what are your other demands um, for clients that are um, currently working with your organization. Um, and then we're asking for your plan for maintaining your existing caseload. Um, so please include specifics about the frequency of your ongoing client interactions, um, and then how you're going to manage that with adding new clients um, if funded in this, um, this next two-year grant cycle. All right, so the next, um, the next uh, section directs us to uh, the leverage, um, leverage and budget. So there's going to be four tabs of the workbook that will um, that you'll have to complete for that. So the first is the leverage tab. So again, keep in mind that you are completing this for the full two years. You'll have a um, a section for pending leverage and a section for committed leverage. Um, you're going to be listing the name of the source and the type of funding, um, the pending amount, the anticipated commitment date, and the length of time that you've historically been receiving uh, this level of funding. Um, and you've got four different drop-down options. 
because um, you've got pending um, leverage, and especially if pending is a, a good portion of, um, of your total program budget, um, we are at asking this question here about um, if that funding does not come through, how, how does your organization plan to fill that gap? So that is a new question that we're asking this year. And then down here, you're going to be listing uh, your committed leverage. Uh, we've done this for a few years now, but just want to point out again that we do not collect uh, your leverage documentation. We're not collecting letters from your organizations, um, listing any, any sort of pending leverage. Um, this is just going to be all self-reported here through this chart. Really, really important to remember, though, again, especially, especially because this is two years, although we did see this quite a bit with the one year as well, um, that um, it's important to prorate. Um, so if you've got a grant that started this year and it's going to take you into only one of the two years of the grant, um, of the 1921 grant, you're only going to be listing um, the portion that applies to that one year. So just keep that in mind. And I'm actually going to um, list an example here so you can see how this carries through into So this tab, we did ask for information about staff um, salaries last year, but this uh, tab has really been um, um, restructured, hopefully in a way that will be much more user friendly. Um, so um, we do have a breakdown here of um, direct service staff and program support staff. Um, and that will, um, you'll see more about that in a minute here. Um, so the direct service staff is defined as anyone who provides the direct financial education and coaching services. And then program support staff, it's going to be defined as anyone that supports those services. So that could include executive directors, program directors, program managers, administrative support staff, accounting staff, um, HR if that's included, um, IT, things like, um, or positions such as those. Um, so here you're going to enter um, the title and then um, the position, so whether it be direct service or program support. Here you're going to list the gross annual salary as of 10-1-2019. Uh, so if you're anticipating a raise between now and the 1st of October, um, you're going to list what that um, what that uh, amount is. So in this case, we've got a direct service staff position um, where they're making uh, 50,000 a year um, growth uh, for gross annual salary. Um, here in this column, you're going to be telling us their FTE in their financial, in your, in the financial empowerment education and coaching program. Um, so say this position um, is maybe split between um, uh, 50 percent um, financial empowerment education and coaching and 50 percent in maybe say a rental assistance program so you're going to list 0.5 the chart will then do the math to say um, the amount that that is um, of that person's salary that's being that would um, cover the services that they're providing under just the financial empowerment education and coaching now this column of the chart takes that and multiplies it by two. So this is really saying this is the maximum amount that you can, um, uh, that you would um, have available or that you would be able to um, uh, pay for with homeownership capacity funds over the two years time. 
Um, and here, then you're going to be entering the amount that you're proposing to pay with those funds. So it could be any amount up to that 50,000. Um, one example with this chart, if you put 51 or anything over 50,000, um, the cell will highlight red um, as a reminder to you to go back and correct, um, correct the error. So in this case, we listed over 50,000. Okay, so just a couple of examples so you can see how this carries over into the budget tab. So you'll see a lot of, a lot of gray spots on this chart. Um, that's good news because that means that a lot of this information is carrying over from previous tabs. This helps to avoid errors um, and just makes it hopefully an easier form to use. Um, so you've got your total program budget. Again, this is covering two years time taken the request from that first tab. So the 20,000 carries over to the budget. And then we've got the leverage. And this is taking um, both the pending and the committed and carrying it over to the budget. So we have a total program budget of, in this example, 32,000. Now, um, from the staff tab, You'll see we've got one direct service uh, position and one program support position. So the amount that you have listed um, in the gross annual uh, salary here are going to carry over here. And then the amount that you listed here that you're going to be paying for with homeownership capacity funds are listed here. The reason that we made this distinction between direct service and program um, support staff is because we really wanted to get a better picture of what, what is your FTE allocation for those that will be working directly with clients. Um, and then separate from that, what, what's the FTE breakdown um, or totals, I should say, uh, for those that will be supporting your program. Up here, you can see that we've got a total per client amount uh, based on the total income, dividing it by the household served. Um, so really what that's taking is um, apologize, I'm trying to remember the math on this now. Okay. So it is, it's taking um, the, total, the total amount for your budget and it's dividing it by the number of households that you're proposing to, to serve. Um, I will say, you know, historically we've heard um, from organizations that um, it costs two to 3,000 um, to serve a client with this intensive service. Um, and that's with all, all funding sources being factored in, which is what this, uh, this is doing here. So if you're noticing that your chart is showing, um, you know, client costs or the total amount being five, six, seven thousand, we've definitely seen that before. Um, you really want to go back to your budget and make sure that it's only reflecting um, your expenses and your leverage for um, your your financial empowerment services. All right, and then you scroll down to the bottom here of the chart and you'll enter in, so this is your total program budget uh, for the different expenses. And then uh, in column F, you'll be telling us how much of the homeownership capacity funds you're proposing to use to pay towards, um, towards that total expense. Um, one change that you'll notice this year is that we don't in include the calculations for the leverage expenditures. Um, we really just want to focus on um, the breakdown for how the homeownership capacity funds will be used. We did move the vendors also into a separate um, tab, which we'll uh, look at here in a minute. Um, do want to point out with a travel expense, 
So um, with the uh, state grant contract, which is the template that we use, um, if your organization is um, proposing to use homeownership capacity funds to pay for any out-of-state travel, you do have to um, get that pre-approved um, uh, through, um, through us here at Minnesota Housing. Um, and there's some specific um, parameters listed out in the program manual. Um, but that's really important just to keep in mind as you're thinking about your expenses and kind of what you're going to be paying or using homeownership capacity funds to pay for. Um, it is an eligible expense as long as it can be tied to the homeownership capacity program. So say you are sending someone to a NeighborWorks Training Institute that's um, in another state, they usually are, um, travel for that is certainly allowed and eligible, um, assuming that the training is for something like the financial capability certification. Um, but again, because it's out of state travel, it does need to be pre-approved um, with, with us. So then going over to the vendors tab, um, here it carries over everything that you're proposing to use homeownership capacity funds to pay for. Here you're going to list any vendors uh, that you are currently working with. And this can be anything from um, healthcare, um, dental insurance, uh, disability insurance, um, any consultants that you're working with, um, if you've got an existing um, relationship um, under any of these categories, you're going to want to list those vendors. The reason for that is because um, they then are included in a waiver under the grant contract. Um, if you have any new vendors, uh, you do have to follow some documentation requirements um, that's outlined in the grant contract in the contracting and bidding section. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about that now, um, but if you do have a concern with that, um, certainly let me know um, and I can share the grant contract with you and we can talk through um, that situation further. I will say um, that the, um, the amount uh, is going to be for the contract, um, not the amount that, or the amount, the amount that, um, that your organization is proposing to include as, a, as the contract as a whole is the amount that follows the contracting and bidding requirements not the amount that's being paid for with the funds. So even if your organization is only going to be using um, maybe $5,000 or paying for $5,000 of a $100,000 contract, you still have to follow the $100,000 contract um, contracting and bidding requirements. So again, if, if you feel like that's going to be um, uh, in your proposal, we can certainly talk through that further. All right, so that covers uh, the application questions and the documentation requirement, or excuse me, the um, questions and the workbook um, responses. We are also asking for applica applicants to provide a fee policy. So if you're charging clients a fee for um, specifically the financial wellness services, uh, we will be asking for that policy to be submitted. Again, this is different than any um, fees charged to um, those that participate in home buyer education and counseling. We do not need to see those fee policies. And then uh, if your organization is a nonprofit, defined as an organization with a 501c3 status, um, that must be demonstrated as part of the application process. Um, and so we will be doing um, just a couple things to note. Um, we will be doing a check of the um, Minnesota Secretary of State website to ensure uh, that um, your organization is listed as active and in good standing. Um, if you're an organization that has not been previously funded, um, we do require um, uh, to receive the 501c3 certification letter with the IRS. And then in addition to that, we are asking for um, documentation uh, from your organization. Um, we are looking at an organization's annual income and that is what's going to determine what documentation we need. I will say for most applicants, um, most 
of them have um, uh, annual income of um, either one of these categories, the uh, 500, excuse me, 50,000 to 750,000 or over 750,000. In most cases, it's this, the over the 750,000. If that's the case, we do need the most uh, recent certified financial audit. Realize a lot of you are um, in the audit process right now, are in the process of completing those audits right now. Um, but again, make sure that you give us the most um, current version of that. Um, we may need to come back to applicants um, later into the summer and ask uh, for their most recent version um, once they have that available. So, and then if your organization's uh, annual income is under the 750,000, um, then we do need the, um, the IRS 990. So only submit one, one of these, um, again, following your organization's annual income. And then we do um, collect, of course, the workbook for all applicants and then the signature page. And the signature page is also on our website. And you're just having uh, the authorized signer for your organization uh, sign um, indicating that um, everything in the application is true and correct. And then you're completing all of these. With um, When you're submitting your signature page, we do ask that you print that off, of course, and have the signature on it. <clears throat> um, and then you'll also notice in, um, uh, in the instructions here that we do have the naming conventions for all of the uh, documents that you're submitting. So with that, I'm going to close out of this and we'll run through a quick example um, in, of uh, submitting the online application. Before we do that, though, um, we've already covered this information. All right. So just a couple of things to, to keep in mind. Um, again, as you're working on the online application, or before submitting, before starting your online application form, as I said before, drafting your responses to the narrative questions in Word. Um, there is no character limit, but we do ask that you keep your responses um, clear and concise. And then as you're working through those narrative questions, um, completing the workbook, and then making sure that you have that signature page completed before you go into the online application form. If a nonprofit that you're preparing the required materials, um, that you're saving using the naming conventions outlined in uh, um, the outlined in the application form. Um, uh, let's see, or excuse me, that, you, that, that are outlined either in the PDF or um, we also have this document on our website, tips for completing your application. And on that, we do have the naming conventions listed on there as well. And actually, these next few slides were all um, taken from, from this document, but I do encourage you to read through it um, as, you're, as you're preparing your application. And then, like I said before, identifying one person who will actually complete your online application form. All right, so we'll pull up the online application form now and we'll um, go through a few, a few items to make sure uh, you feel comfortable using it. So I've actually already started um, in here, but if, you, um, if you're a new user, um, it, will look, it will look the same. All right, so because I've already started this, like I said, um, the fillable fields are already going to be filled out, but just want you to get a sense of what this is gonna look like. So you've got um, the bar up here, which tells you how far into the application you are. Um, and then again, this is all going to follow um, the breakout uh, in that PDF. So moving from page to page, uh, you do have to complete um, all the required fields before you're able to move to the next page. 
But once you move to the next page, then you're able to go um, either to the previous page or to the next page. Um, again, if it's a required field and you haven't completed it, uh, you will get an error message at the top here saying um, what you need to um, what you need to do before you can move on. So in this instance, we'll say yes, returning grantee. Click next. And then you're going to be able to go through uh, through the application. This application does um, save your work as you uh, click as you click next um, at the bottom of, of each tab. Um, one important thing to keep in mind, though, is that um, the uh, the application itself um, will time out. So even if you're in here um, typing. Uh, typing your responses, um, the lack of movement from page to page um, is going to cause the system to time out if you haven't moved to the next page within um, within an hour. So that's why we say complete all of your responses outside of the online application form and then just go in and uh, enter your responses or copy and paste your responses over. It's important to keep in mind um, that uh, your computer may also time out. And if that's the case, anything um, that you're working on on that existing page will not be saved. However, anything from the previous pages uh, should be saved as long as you've clicked, as long as you've clicked next. Um, you, if you go in uh, to the application, you're in, you uh, don't complete your responses, you are able to um, close out of it and go back into it. Uh, if you do that, um, you will be asked to uh, enter the same information that you did when you started your application. And then you'll be able to see that the previous answers have um, uh, have been saved. And then you'll be able to go to the next. Um, so the question is, do I have to complete the questions in order? I don't see a back button. Uh, so yes, you'll have to complete the questions in the order that they're set up uh, in the system. And then if you wish to go back and make changes to a previous question, um, you just um, uh, um, click previous to do that. Um, another question is um, using your computer while working uh, in the online application form. You can uh, enter the application from um, any any computer. You don't have to use the same computer. Um, to work on the online responses. Um, the only thing that you will need is the name and the email address of the person that has started uh, the application um, under, under your name. Um, there is a spell check function in, in this. And then um, as you go through, And then you'll see if you do answer yes, uh, it will um, access the additional questions that you need to respond to. Otherwise, if you click no, it won't um, it won't pull up those questions, and it will take you to the next. All right. And the, there's another question about do we need to use a certain browser? And the answer is no to that. Just going through here because I want people to be able to see uh, the upload page. So here, of course, um, you're asked about the topics and subtopics. 
Um, if you click on all of these and then you realize that you're not providing that topic, uh, if you click on NA, it's going to um, take the checks away from all the other boxes. So here, if your organization is considered a nonprofit, you will um, have um, the option to upload uh, certain files. So you'll click on that and you will click browse and select your document and then click upload. And you'll see that the title of the document is there. If you select that you're a nonprofit, you will be required to upload a document. Uh, the system isn't going to be able to check and make sure that you have um, that you have the correct document in there, though. So that's really important that you um, look at what the requirements are um, with each of these. And then you're going to be submitting your workbook. And then the signature page. All right, so this is where you're going to be submitting your application. So you select finish and you're going to get a message here that says that you will receive an email. Um, and then so that email will then also include um, all your responses to all the questions in a it's a lit or structured as a um, I believe it's a PDF or um, something similar to that. Um, so if you wanted to actually save the questions that you worked on, we also recommend you keep uh, keep that Word document that you were drafting your responses on outside of the system. Um, if you started the application and haven't finished it yet, we will be sending um, reminders uh, that you have an incomplete application in the system. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then um, there's another question here about if, if you've already uh, completed the application, but you realize that maybe you needed to make a change in the workbook and you've got to change the workbook um, that you submitted or you wanted to change one of the questions, you're able to do that up until uh, the due date um, and time in the system. So what you'll do to do that is you'll go back in So here you'll get a message saying you've already submitted your application. Do you wish to edit your response? Click edit. So you'll click edit and then you will just um, hit the buttons at the bottom, the next button to get to the question or questions that you wish to change. You can make those changes, um, select finish. Um, and then we will not be pulling any of the applications um, that have been submitted until after the due date and time. Um, so if you've replaced anything in the application, we're only going to be accessing that um, that that latest version. Um, one really important piece to keep in mind, though, is that the system will shut off um, after three o'clock. So at 3:01, people will not be able to make any changes. Um, they also will not be able to make um, they will not be able to submit anything through the system. So we highly recommend that you uh, try to get your application submitted uh, two to three days in advance of that due date. Um, because like I said, even if you're um, in the process of completing an application but haven't hit that finish button um, and received that confirmation email, um, we will not be able to accept, uh, accept that application. All right, I think 
we talked about everything from that. Um, all right. So uh, again, everything's going to be submitted uh, via this online application form. So it's different from uh, leak file, um, which is uh, what we used last year. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the online application will be the only uh, method for um, accepting the application materials. Um, if you try to submit it in any other way, we won't be able to accept that. Um, and then we just have a list of other um, other items that we won't accept. We've already given this breakdown of the points as we went through the application questions, but you've got that summary here. And just a reminder that the application due date is 3 p.m. on Tuesday, April 23rd. Uh, the selections process um, will occur um, after, after that. Um, we'll be doing um, completing uh, our reviews and then presenting to the selection committee in June. And then we will be uh, taking our recommendations to board in um, late July. And then we'll have grant contracts and a kickoff event that will occur um, uh, before the um, beginning of the program year. The grant contracts will be emailed uh, in August. And that concludes uh, our presentation. We'll wait for just a minute here to see if there are any questions. I am not seeing any other questions show up. Um, so we'll go ahead and sign off for today. Um, certainly don't hesitate to reach out to us. We've got our email address and our phone number here on this last slide. I'm happy to talk through, um, talk through anything uh, further with you. Thanks so much for your time today. Have a great afternoon.